Everything you touch is atoms that are made out of electrons. And you say, well, where are the positrons? This is a great mystery in physics, is why is the universe, as far as we know, made almost entirely out of what we call ordinary matter, which is just half of this pair of particles that, that we think fundamentally are always produced together. Okay, well, let me uh, answer that a little indirectly, but I'll, I'll get to the answer to that. So if you imagine taking a, the, the simplest atom is a hydrogen atom. It's a proton in the middle, an electron going around the outside. And if we just think about the electron for a minute, special relativity tells us that because that electron has mass, it has energy. This is the most famous equation in physics, E equals mc squared. Every hour we spend on that planet will be seven years back on Earth. Well, that's relativity, folks. Mass is a form of energy, and we can convert different kinds of energy into mass and vice versa. So we can also think about visible light like we see here, and that visible, although we're not usually aware of it, that visible light comes in the form of little particles that we call photons. But the energy in a visible photon is much less than the energy that the electron has in its mass. But if we go up to shorter wavelengths of light, ultraviolet, X-rays, and we get to something that we call gamma rays, but they're really just light, those come in big, beefy photons. And those photons, for example, you can detect with a Geiger counter. You can see them one at a time, bang, 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 through a Geiger counter. And a photon like that has enough energy, can have more energy than the mass of the electron. And so if you take this big beefy photon and it's coming along with all this energy, if it hits, say, a nucleus of an atom, it can lose some momentum there and produce actually two particles with the mass of the electron. But they won't be two electrons. So one of them will be an electron with a negative charge, and one will be a particle that we call positron with a positive charge. And they're always produced in these pairs. And so those two particles kind of always come together. They're, so they're sort of like partner particles, although we don't call them that. What we call them is one is a particle and one is the antiparticle. So the electron is the antiparticle of the positron and the positron is the antiparticle of the electron. They're a pair of particles that share many characteristics. They're, they're not identical, you can tell them apart. So the electron has a negative charge, the positron has a positive charge, and so if you put them, for example, into a magnetic field, one goes around one way, one goes the other way, and so we can distinguish them. That's in fact how positrons were first discovered. Antimatter is really just another kind of particle that's there all the time in, in that simple picture. For example, you could take a hydrogen atom, again, with a proton and an electron, and replace the proton, the, Protons also have antiparticles, and we call them antiprotons. So if you take the proton, replace it with an antiproton, it'll have the opposite charge, but it's otherwise like a proton. And you take the electron, replace it with a positron, you have the same electrical forces because you've swapped the, the charges on the two particles. And so that's held together as an atom, just like an ordinary hydrogen atom, except the particles are replaced with their antiparticles. And so we call that anti-hydrogen. In that little universe, uh, there really isn't any distinction between particles and antiparticles. They're just, they're, they're because they're produced in pairs, there's like, you get one of these, you get one of those. So there's sort of two answers. There's the scientific question we might ask, could put it this way, the reason we study antimatter is that we think that it's going to tell us something very fundamental about the basic properties of the universe. In particular, this sort of theory we have about how these particles are always produced in pairs and so forth, which is, is really a small piece of what's called the standard model of particle physics. And we describe many, many things that we see in accelerators and so forth. But we know it's somehow incomplete because A, it doesn't explain why the universe is mostly matter rather than equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And there's some other things also that it doesn't, we know about that it doesn't explain, but we don't know why. So one of the reasons to study antimatter is to elucidate these very fundamental questions. So in the little picture I described, a hydrogen atom and its antiparticle, the antihydrogen, should have exactly the same energy levels. And so it's a real interest to study, well, do they really have exactly this? Can we measure these things very precisely and compare them? Likewise, properties of the electron and the positron, they should, as I say, they're not 
the one's positive and one's negative. But for example, they both act like little magnets that, as if they were little balls spinning on their axis. And so you can put an a, a electron into a magnetic field and it'll go around. You can compare them. You say, are they really the same? And you can look and they go, yeah, they, you know, I, I checked and they're, they're the same too. Like uh, a part in a thousand, a part in a million, yes. A part in a billion, yes. And at the current level of, of tests of this is at the parts in a trillion level. <laughs> and as far as we know, they work exactly like I described. They're exactly opposite of each other in just the ways that we expect from the simple picture, right? I outline. If there's any deviation there, though, that's going to be some kind of a hint of that there's something more going on that we don't, that's not included in our standard particle uh, physics models. And, we're, and there's got to be something there, but finding it is the hard part. And so studying antimatter, though, can be done in these very low energy experiments, unlike a big accelerator. And so it's a way of probing aspects of particle physics that you can't directly get by going to the Large Hadron Collider and smashing protons together, which is the way we usually do particle physics. So it does probe the very fundamental uh, issues in physics. One practical application, there's a kind of imaging that's used in, in medicine it's called positron emission tomography. You feed a patient a molecule that's sort of biologically active that will be preferentially absorbed into, say, cancer cells that are growing quickly, and that molecule has been uh, has a little bit of a radioactive uh, isotope in it. And so you feed it to the patient and that molecule accumulates in, say, the cancer cells. And then as the radioactive isotope decays, emits a positron, that positron immediately finds an electron, they annihilate, and so gamma rays come out of the patient and you can then image those gamma rays coming out. So it's sort of the opposite of X-rays where we send X-rays in and try to look, but you can see where the gamma rays are coming from and you can therefore, for example, map out where the cancer has spread in a patient. It's a way of doing fundamental particle physics of trying to understand the most basic aspects about the universe by doing these extremely precise measurements on antimatter, we hope to learn about particle physics. It does occur in nature briefly. Uh, so one source uh, is radioactive decays, some isotopes. So in fact, each of us within our bodies has potassium. If you're a healthy adult, you carry around a certain amount of potassium, you eat your bananas in the morning. And one of the common isotopes of uh, potassium is actually radioactive, and so there's a certain amount of radioactive potassium in your body, and one of the decay channels, it's very rare, but occasionally potassium-40 decays by emitting a positron, and that positron will then uh, find an electron in your body, and when the positron and the electron come together, they convert now back into light, gamma rays, and you get a pair of gamma rays coming out like that. So every once in a while in your body, there's going to be a positron briefly, and it's going to annihilate, and then poof, you're going to emit a couple of gamma rays. There's also antimatter coming in from up above. Uh, high energy particles hit the upper atmosphere, and they produce showers of particles constantly, including the most common one that comes down to the Earth is muons, which is kind of a heavy version of the electron. And about once a minute, a muon goes through a target that size. So if you imagine putting that on your head, about once a minute or a few times a minute, a muon is going through your head and about half of those are particles and half are antiparticles, muons and antimuons. Those aren't very practical sources. Uh, so if you want to actually study antimatter, uh, there are radioactive isotopes that produce uh, positrons uh, fairly copiously. And you have the challenge then is you have to sort of, they come flying out and you have to not let them hit anything, because if they hit any solid object, they're going to immediately convert into photons. Uh, but if you collect them, you can guide them and slow them properly, and that's a, a source of, uh, of positrons. For anti-protons, a proton is, is a couple thousand times more massive than uh, an electron, and it requires, therefore, a couple thousand times more energy to produce an antiproton. And those are typically produced at accelerators by slamming high energy protons into a target and again converting that energy in many particles come out, including antiprotons. That's a good question. Certainly, you know, I mean, my first introduction to antimatter was from watching Star Trek. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise.
it was, that's how it powers the enterprise. Uh, so there's always this sort of, you know, thought of like, could you use it? If you have a certain, like a kilogram of electrons and a kilogram of positrons, they have exactly the same energy. But if you bring them together, as we talked about, you can completely convert that mass into energy. There's a huge potential energy, amount of energy that can be released there. It's half in the electrons and half in the positrons. So it's not like it's all in the antimatter somehow. There's some, in some sense, they're exactly the same, but uh, there's this opportunity to completely convert the mass into energy. Whereas in an ordinary chemical reaction, for example, if you take two hydrogen atoms and bring them together to make a hydrogen molecule, that releases some energy. If you were to comp compare the mass of the two hydrogen atoms to the mass of the molecule, you'd find the molecule actually weighs a little less because some of the energy uh, was released. And so it's, I mean, you're never going to see this like weighing things out on a chemical balance. But uh, if you very precisely measure all the constituent particles and so forth, we can now tell that in fact, the mass of the hydrogen molecule has to be less. But it's a tiny fraction, maybe a billionth of the mass gets converted into energy. If you do a fusion reaction, like in the sun, and you take hydrogen atoms and combine them to produce uh, helium and some other things, and you could look, were to look there, much more of the initial mass has been converted into energy, maybe a million times more uh, larger energy output. But it's still, if you were to look, you know, 99.9% .9 of the mass is still there. And so if you imagine, again, you're trying to make a rocket engine or something, burning hydrogen, which is what we do now, or equivalent, you basically take a very, very tiny fraction of of the energy that was there in the form of mass and converted into useful energy. If you could build a fusion rocket, which no one's done, <laughs> then that would be more efficient in using the fuel. And so the dream is if you had an antimatter, you could take all of the energy in the mass. You would need very little fuel compared to even your fusion rocket to uh, do it. Now, the hard part is if you really just take electrons and positrons and put them together, as I said, what you get is gamma rays coming out. So. Uh, that's not gonna make your rocket go forward. So somehow, if you wanna make a rocket go this way, you have to get momentum to come out the back of the rocket that way. And no, no, Cooper, Three. Cooper, what are you doing? They're in third law. They gotta leave something behind. You told me we had enough resources for both of us. There, so there's, a, let's say there's an engineering challenge to be overcome there to imagine making a useful uh, rocket motor. But the conceptually, carrying a little bit of antimatter would be like the most efficient way you could have to sort of use all of the energy that's available. Well, as I told you, we don't really know the answer to that. Uh, so uh, as, if you can answer that, you're gonna win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it is in, in the fundamental processes, as we understand them, it should basically be producing equal amounts of matter and antimatter. But I'd say the curiosity is like, this has always been the drive to understand the world we see around us and to, to really uh, pr keep probing the fundamentals from, we go back at one point, you know, we had fire, water, air, and earth or whatever, or the elements and we, you know, people kept pushing and they realized, well, no, no, that's not really, I mean, we can break those things down and really we, we've learned about atoms and then we learned about what was inside atoms. So this is continuing that long-standing quest, I would say, to really understand the world around us.